That's nonsense. That's the, Ameri- the, Ameri- the American Academy looked at that over two years ago very thoroughly and published a paper in the journal Science showing that the hockey stick stood up. But could I say, the one exciting thing that's happened in, in Australia in the last year or so is that industry, not least the round table, uh, of, of a number of companies like Westpac, AIG, Swiss Re and so on, have come together, and they're very sceptical people with lots of experience. And Fiona Wayne, who's in the audience representing uh, business and in, environment, a whole number of people are doing those wonderfully effective things, facing up as you have, to what is a clear and apparent problem. I think, I think it's an important point. I mean, if you, if you look at the coal producers, the coal producers this year have committed $1 billion uh, to the deployment of low emission technologies. Now, companies are rational entities and they are, uh, in this instance, uh, recognising the seriousness of the problem and saying, we are going to be involved in the development of the solutions that not only Australia, but but the rest of the world needs. And they don't do that because they're pathetic. They do that because they understand their, their, their uh, responsibilities to the world and because it's, uh, it's the right business decision to and take. Done okay, and because there's a buck yes. to be made, there's now an entire industry. This is a book I just got from America, the Financial Review today. There's a lot of money to be made by industries that hop on board the carbon train. That's, that's, that's another fine. reason they're doing it. Making okay, money. Okay. I, I just want to, I'm going to interrupt because there's at least one of our panel... At least one of our panel we haven't heard from yet, and I'm sure uh, Greg Bourne, the sceptics, would regard you as a turncoat, uh, former (laughs) chief executive of BP Australia. Certainly not, apparently. To uh, CEO of the uh, World Wildlife Fund. Now, were you surprised uh, to find that some of the key sceptics within the global warming swindle, the great global warming swindle, were actually people who have long-standing connections uh, with big oil and even with big tobacco? I I guess the way I'd look at this, Tony, is that... um and I've got 35 years as a chemist, engineer and businessman. In 1992, uh, 1995, BP said, let's leave behind the Ravenses, let's leave behind the Bob Carters, let's leave behind these sceptics. There's enough science background knowledge inside those companies to critically analyse what was going on. Sure, there's uncertainty, but the way business goes is thinks about risk and it works out what are the probabilities and should, should we move. In 1997, a company like BP moved and recognised, just like Nikki said, climate change is a real issue. It's a real issue for mankind. We need to deal with it very, very quickly. Uh, we have the ability, the ability to tap into the best of peer-reviewed scientists, such as David Caroli, and interrogate him and interrogate his scepticism. But in the end, it's about the management of risk. And business these days has moved on. There is not, I think, a serious board member, CEO in Australia, and really in the world these days, who doesn't look at climate change as a serious risk and doesn't automatically nowadays ignore some of the people we saw in the film. But sitting right next to you is a serious scientist who believes there is no risk. No, I don't. no, no, of course climate change is a serious risk. That's not the question, Tony. The, Tony, uh, the question is whether human-caused climate change is a dangerous risk. Now, you very much concentrated in your comments on the film on challenging Martin Durkin's credentials. You then chose to challenge a couple of the scientists. This is the point. This isn't about Martin Durkin. He's just the filmmaker. It's about the hypothesis of dangerous human-caused global warming. That's a science hypothesis. It needs to be tested with facts. Martin Durkin did that in the film. Here are three of them. Since 1998, the global temperature has stayed static or declined no, it hasn't. over eight years and carbon dioxide has increased by 4%, 15 ppm. The hypothesis predicts that warming will have occurred. It hasn't. It That's has. a test of the hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK, well, we'll, we'll test the hypothesis with another the, scientist. David no, we Crowley. won't. Tony, David the, no, Tony, the, okay, well, the second... Let's the let's second you have to and finish your point. And, the uh, second, I'm sorry about that. The second test is during the 20th century... Temperature increased and carbon dioxide increased. The temperature did all this. There is no statistical correlation. The, te- the hypothesis fails the second test. The third test is in the ice cores. The change in temperature precedes the change in carbon dioxide. The hypothesis fails the third test. Science is about testing hypotheses. The dangerous human caused global warming hypothesis has been tested and it failed. Let's go to uh, David Crowley. Maybe you could answer the last point first, because that, that ice core data 
is extremely interesting, but as I understand it, most scientists agree uh, that that is exactly what happened, but they don't Certainly. think it has relevance. Well, no, it, it actually has a <laughs> lot of relevance. No, no, I mean, it doesn't have relevance to human uh, CO2. It even has relevance to human well, CO2. Well, explain, explain to us why. Sure. The ice age and interglacial or warm period cycle is... Most scientists would agree, and I think even Dr Carter agrees, that it's probably initiated by changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And those changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun initiate warming, particularly in higher latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, and they initiate these warming periods. Then the carbon dioxide increases coming out of the ocean act to enhance that warming. They provide a feedback. And that feedback and the link between temperature and CO2 is very important. But it's certainly true that in those ice age interglacial periods, the carbon dioxide did not lead the temperatures. It was actually the temperatures starting first. But without the carbon dioxide changing, it would not have been possible to get the magnitude of the warming. So CO2 is very important <clears throat> in causing the increases in temperature. You can't get those temperature changes without the CO2 feedback. Let's look at the other thing that's happened in the last 50 years or 100 years, we've had carbon dioxide increases that are now 30% higher than at any time over the last 1 million years. We've gone outside the range of carbon dioxide variations that have been experienced in 1 million years. Well, What's give special can you, about can, a million years? Can, can you actually, uh, excuse me, Bob Carter for one second. Can you give us the figures? Because uh, sure. let's, let's deal with the actual figures. We are talking Carbon dioxide concentrations million. are 380 parts per million this year. They never exceeded 300 parts per million at any time over the last 650,000 years. Well, could I actually mention yes, Robin Williams? something uh, coming to risk? But before then, I actually interviewed Jeff Severinghouse at the Scripps Institution, who did the work on this lag thing. And he was outraged at the way his own work had been distorted, both in the Australian press and in the movie. And there's no question, if you imagine, for instance, that a house is on, you know, is, is on fire, uh, the heat comes from some other process, and then the CO2 is like a sort of petrol being chucked on the blaze, increasing things. So it might start in other ways. But let me come to this question of evidence and risk. Today, the new scientist and one of the people in the film, Nigel Calder was way back on The New Scientist, have brought out a special ages issue. Ages He's a friend of mine. I found him last night. I congratulated him on his work. Um, in fact, his father was in the first science show, so there. <laughs> <laughs> what? Even older, Lord Richie Calder. The New We've Scientist... for a long time. <laughs> yes. Please continue. The New Scientist, special report issued today, Climate Myths, and they say responding to, despite the claims made in the great global warming swindle, there is now an overwhelming amount of evidence that the world is warming and that this warming is due to increased levels of greenhouse gases caused by human activity. And they go through each of the myths that they discern in that movie. And when you go to the Australian Academy of Science, Kurt Lambeck, who's the president, put out an, uh, a statement today saying those who deny human-induced global warming are in the same camp as those, those that deny smoking causes lung cancer and that the CFCs deplete the ozone layer. He says there is too much at stake to be sidetracked by discredited theories and out-of-date data. Now, let's accept that there may be no absolute proof in science. There's always doubt. We love doubt. None of us wants this actually to be the case. But make an assessment of what the risk is. Let's say, as Steve Schneider does, whom we had in the film, that it's maybe one in five. OK, we're talking about the future of the world. Let's say there's one in five chance of your car blowing up on the way home or your plane crashing. One in five. Would you get on that plane? Would you drive that car? So would you take the risk... Right, well, let, me, let, me, let me go back to, uh, in order to respond to that and some other things, let me go back to uh, Bob Carter. I mean, would you take that risk? Is that risk worth taking? One in five? I mean, he's got to be joking. That is the problem. Uh, one of the arguments that's often used is the precautionary principle. And, and in a sense, that's what Robin's saying. I'm going to fly home to Townsville tomorrow. I know there's a chance the plane will crash. Does that mean I don't get on the plane? A very low one. Uh, of course. Possibly if, of it was course. One in, if one in Robin five, you probably Robin wouldn't get has, on the plane. Robin's just made the point. A very low one. 
The precautionary principle is intellectually vacuous because it does not specify the degree of risk.